Welcome to the 2021 Bampton Lectures. As Chair of the Bampton Committee, I'm delighted, along with the Reverend Dr William Lamb, to welcome you, at least virtually, to the University Church in Oxford. The Bampton Lectures were founded by the will of the Reverend John Bampton, who lived from 1690 to 1751, and first took place here at the University Church in 1780, where the lectures have been delivered ever since. The Bampton Lecturer is selected by the heads of the Oxford Colleges. These prestigious lectures, originally described as Divinity Lecture Sermons, have covered a range of theological subjects over the years. They have sometimes courted controversy, they've always been intellectually stimulating. I'm delighted that this year's Bampton Lecturer is the Reverend Canon Dr Jessica Martin, only the third female Bampton Lecturer since 1780. Dr. Martin is Residentary Canon for Learning at Ely Cathedral. She read English at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, and has a doctorate in English on early modern religious writing and religious lives. Her monograph on Isaac Walton's lives of John Donne, Richard Hooker, George Herbert, and Robert Sanderson were published by Oxford University Press in 2001. From 1999 to 2010, she was Fellow and Director of Studies in English at Trinity College, Cambridge, during which time she was ordained priest, and in 2010 she became a parish priest full-time in South Cambridgeshire. Her most recent book, published by Canterbury Press last year, is Holiness and Desire, What Makes Us Who We Are. We're so pleased that Dr. Martin is our 2021 Bampton Lecturer, and she will this morning deliver the first two of her four lectures on the theme, Four-Dimensional Eucharist. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Thank you for your welcome. I'm delighted to be here. In 2017, the American poet Patricia Lockwood published her memoir, Priest Daddy. Towards the end of it, she holds up to her readers a vision of the Eucharist. Lockwood, described by the New York Times as the smutty metaphor queen of Lawrence, Kansas, doesn't seem the obvious first voice for a series of theological lectures. She came to prominence in 2013 with her witty, painful poem, Rape Joke which spoke powerfully, more powerfully than she expected, to a world in which rape is the dark, unacknowledged rite of passage for a grimly high percentage of young women. Lockwood's 2017 memoir, an account of her growing up as one of five children to a Lutheran pastor turned Roman Catholic priest, directs a similarly intense, vivid, funny, anguished vision outwards on the world. Lockwood, in prose and in poetry, is never abstract. All her effects are physical, visceral, felt with and in a body of constant and shifting passions. Sex is her go-to theme for thinking about other things, and she does an awful lot of thinking. Towards the end of her memoir, she and her husband Jason pay a visit to her parents. At the same time, a new monstrance arrives for her father in the post from London. But Jason, a former Baptist, has no idea what a monstrance is. So she tells him. A monstrance is a sort of 24 carat solid gold sunburst that holds the body of the Lord. There's a window at the centre, and a thousand rays reach out of it in every direction, so it stands on the altar like a permanent dawn. The word monstrance means to show. And when I read it, up rises that round image of the bread through the glass, 
bread that my own father had consecrated, at the climax of a metaphor that is more than a metaphor, at the moment when real time intersects with eternity. How to explain this moment to someone who never believed it, could never believe it, that bells ring, that the universe kneels, that what happened enters into the house of what is always happening and sits with it together and eats at its table. At this moment, Patricia Lockwood is doing her own piece of showing. She lifts up to us a something she has doubts about being able to realise. How to explain this moment to someone who never believed it, could never believe it, she asks. She's being a translator, a kind of wry indigenous interpreter for the incomprehensibly strange. She has a foot in both worlds. There is the old world in which bread changes the universe, and there is the new in which it never could and never has. So, for these lectures, Lockwood turns out to be a powerful voice. She is fluent in more than one language, with a split sensibility. Her imagination skitters with sceptical, internet-shaped irony, yet is steeped in the old reality of ontological change. As a poet, her business is holding words up to the world our bodies know. She does this in funny and inconvenient and silly and tragic and occasionally joyful ways. Yet she also shows us, through her spectacularly divided self, something about ourselves. She shows us that we moderns have a deeply conflicted relationship with what I'm going to call intangible realities. By intangible realities, I mean beliefs, the basis of which are imaginary or invisible, rather than empirical. And I'm going to ask you to sit with that word imaginary, which we tend to use as a synonym for not real, and ask yourselves whether not real is really a very satisfactory or complete description for the reach and apprehension of the human mind. We have all, believers and non-believers alike, grown up understanding that our deepest trust must be in scepticism. We should test every thought. What we should test every thought against isn't quite so self-evident. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, remarked Prince Hamlet, though as with much that he says, it's not clear whether either he or we should believe him. In the plot of Shakespeare's Hamlet, the apparently empirical evidence of sight and hearing sits on a tricky border between the internal workings of the mind and the outward activity of the world, a border so ambiguous that the audience quickly learns to trust nothing. The ghost may or may not be real, and the ghost may or may not be truthful. The separateness of the ghost's reality for the un from the unreliable workings of Hamlet's perceptions is never certain. In this ambiguity, Prince Hamlet's outlook is indeed early modern, and it's one we late moderns might recognise. For in spite of the fierce grip with which we clutch rationality, the unstable relationship between mind and world which permeates Hamlet hands down to us a haunting which we also must endure. This too is a ghost of what may or may not be real, a ghost who whispers to us that our perceptions may be liars, this ghost shows itself in our relationship with the past, especially to memory and the dead. It shows itself in the authority we assign to the inner self as the ultimate judge of what is true, authentic or sincere. And it also shows itself in the many challenges to that inner authority. 
It shows itself in our huge cultural fascination with imagined worlds in which words change the shape of physical objects and states. Worlds built about the concept of magical mind power, which flourish within the genres of fantasy, gaming, anime, cosplay, and even science fiction. Such worlds are safely defined as fictive, but are also immersive and powerful. Hamlet's ghost shows itself in the suspicion with which we approach anything which claims a universal supernatural truth, and also in the eagerness with which we embrace the bittier, more controllable promises of spirituality. It shows itself in our uncertainty about how to define the real in a world dominated by internet representation. It shows itself in our anguished relationship with mental health and in our troubled relationship with our actual bodies. It shows itself in the difficult negotiations within medicine on the borders between physical and mental disease and within the legal system on the borders between transgressive and emotionally wounded behaviour. It shows itself in our fascination with the limits of the empirical, the points where our physical sens senses prove to be unreliable witnesses. It shows itself in our continuing doubt as to whether such terms as good or bad can even retain a stable collective meaning at all. And it shows itself in our inability to manage without them. That's quite a list. Everyone, religious or not, has a few items sitting in the intangible reality category, whether that's love or decency or the common good or self-belief or some other social imaginary. Often we call them values, though we seldom dare to ask what exactly they measure. It is simply not possible only to admit the reality of testable phenomena. Nobody can really manage to live that way, though a few have tried. On the whole, we modern human beings continue to believe in a motley, self-selected ragbag of unprovable stuff, because we can't help it. Yet we find our own tendency to belief unjustifiable. To believe and not believe at the same time is a profoundly fracturing experience. Yet every modern person, including the kind with religious beliefs, is always doing it. You could put our problem this way. We hold that our information about what is real is derived from physical evidence, direct or extrapolated, from the world we encounter through our senses. Bread is always and only bread. But we also hold that the shaping power of thoughts, feelings and ideas is authoritative, authoritative enough to govern, reorder and, if necessary, override the dumb, obdurate evidence of our physicality. Bread is not always and only bread. Each of these positions notices something true about how embodied, self-conscious human beings make sense of the world. But they don't fit together. Metaphysical is just not talking to physical, to use some old-fashioned categories. We cannot see ourselves whole. I've said this is a problem for everyone, the irreligious as much as the religious, and it is. But for these lectures, I'm going to concentrate on the problems it poses for the modern but believing Christian or any modern person seriously considering Christian belief. For the Christian, the distrust of physics for metaphysics is a massive issue because Christianity makes claims which join the two together intimately. Christianity is incarnational, binding the invisible to the visible in the historical material humanity of Jesus in space and time. Its spiritual claims, therefore, are embedded in the physical world of bodies and behaviours and actions. It's true that Jesus himself, drawing upon one strand of his Judaic tradition, 
stressed that the convictions of the heart, its disposition towards God and neighbour, carried more authority than physical practices or behaviours. But Jesus also, and most unsettlingly, tightened the bond between soul and body. His healing miracles seemed to collapse the distinction between physical and spiritual restoration. This close alignment of bodily with spiritual healing finds powerful imitative expression in the many burgeoning versions of modern Christianity, mostly Pentecostal ones in the majority world, but it is hugely problematic for post-enlightenment cultures such as ours. During these pandemic times, it has been especially and painfully jarring to try to set spiritual and bodily needs in alignment when the medical requirements of social distancing and physical isolation have stripped away so much of the soul's comfort. Yet the Christian hope does align soul and body. Jesus' redemptive work was a bodily event, but the restoration it promised was also spiritual. He offered himself, physically broken by the political machine, as a sacrifice in order to liberate the human soul into reconciliation with the creator of all. But sacrifices don't work rationally, they work symbolically. It's not actually self-evident how one man's death realigns the whole of humanity, which is why strap lines which say, he died for you, don't have automatic impact on populations trained only in utilitarian and consequentialist thinking. And the resurrection is a differently messy phenomenon. It isn't some kind of metaphor. It's not even, to use Lockwood's words, a metaphor that is more than a metaphor. It's bodily. A body, once dead, now living, proclaiming himself there and then as the sign for the intimate rejoining of mortal humanity with the eternal intangible being of God. Resurrection re knits, renews, remembers the life of memory with the life in the world of time and space. The risen Jesus ate drank, cooked and served breakfast, walked a day's journey, broke bread, touched and was touched. There is no hint in the Gospels that his resurrection was just an idea. But after only a few weeks of this, Jesus did vanish physically from the world. We will mark that moment this coming Thursday, bringing the Easter season to its end in the Feast of the Ascension. Jesus promised instead a companion as powerful and untouchable as wind or flame, called the Holy Spirit, and he left behind him a trail of human-told stories and human-made rituals, which made and make claims to contain him, and yet also to be inadequate to contain him. For all Christians beyond that first generation, Jesus, risen and ascended and awaited, is always both here and not here, remembered and expected and yet abiding, yesterday and today and forever. When we celebrate the Eucharist, Jesus, the host at the feast where we are guests, is in physical terms both absent and present. What happened? enters into the house of what is always happening and sits with it together and eats at its table. All rituals of worship, Christian or not, are events on a borderline between physicality and the unseen world. All rituals of worship treat this borderline as a porous one and the rituals are modes for crossing it, for bringing the one into the other. The Eucharist does this work too, but its border crossing is a charged, even an unstable experience. Its meanings are impossible for the human-made ritual to control, especially as Christians themselves are deeply split about what those meanings are and how they happen. 
One provocative way of putting this is to say that it's not totally clear, from the inside as well as from the outside, whether the Eucharistic community, when it meets together to encounter the presence of God, is doing a world-changing something, or a private, reflective, rather undramatic nothing. I'll say it another way. When we put together Jesus' physical absence with our inherited modern ambivalence about the power of symbolic action, we exert a huge pressure on the right of the Eucharist. How can we come close to Jesus, human and divine, now taken from the world and awaited eschatologically? Is the sacramental bread our means to see, touch and taste God, or just a way of invoking a completely inward, perhaps slippery and deniable reality of thought and feeling? A good many Christians also believe that bread is only bread, even though they may also believe that they may be transformed by a powerful inner event. At the same time, they know that the choked avenues of emotion don't offer reliable messages and that they will probably be left asking, did anything happen just now? How will I know? It's not clear also in a rite which celebrates a physical body in its absence, what irreducible basics the rite requires. Do we need to gather physically when our absent Lord is present everywhere? Do we need to specify a place, a time, a physical community, when he brings with him the unlocated benefits of eternity? How quickly will we, like King Lear's older daughters, strip our ceremony of symbolic power until we move from providing the minimal signs of honour to providing no signs of honour at all because they're not needed? Why have a ritual at all? What need one? At what point will we find that calling all absence presence turns God's presence into absence? Or is it that we are living in a world in which the Christians who went before us have already done that and now the churches are empty? The anthropologist Webb Keane, in his influential book Christian Moderns, describes the anxiety of his Dutch Calvinist missionaries as they slowly convert the inhabitants of the Indonesian island of Sumba. They've successfully persuaded their converts that their sacred places are not sacred, that their sacred rituals are meaningless, that all that is needed to be close to God is an inward faith. But the missionaries are left with a nagging worry. Did they empty out the physical world so much, leaving only the slender thread of inner conviction in order to pave the way for the Sumba to discover unbelief? Have they shut the way between the sacred and the material world? O oh, reason not the need. It isn't God's needs that are met in ritual. Jesus didn't ask us to do this in remembrance of me because he needed it. He asks this of us because the need is ours, body and soul. I'm not setting up to solve these dilemmas. I'm as compromised and conflicted as anyone else born into our time and our place. I can't see clearly around or outside the shifty, opaque and inconsistent ways of knowing that have shaped us all. Yet the thing, that holy thing, as the herald of the incarnation Gabriel put it, that I have put my trust into declaring that I know, the thing that brings tangible and intangible truth together into one, is held up to humanity and then broken, shared and consumed in the sacrament of the altar, in the Eucharist. How can the Eucharist hold the heart of meaning? Can rituals invoke God? Why would he come? Across my lifetime, I have read accounts of the Eucharist which confidently claim transformative divine meaning for it. And across my lifetime, the Eucharist has been the default setting for regular Christian worship. I have been to drab Eucharists, 
clunky Eucharists. I've been to frankly embarrassing Eucharists. I've been to hieratic Eucharists, intimate Eucharists, to village Eucharists, morning Eucharists. I've been to Eucharists that were feasts of the senses and to Eucharists of indigestible dryness. I have been bored, infuriated, restless, indifferent, anguished, opened up, closed down, unsettled, even occasionally joyful. I've wept on receiving the host and I felt nothing at all. In this, my experience mirrors that of most Christians for whom the sacraments are significant. And in this, I am in a minority within this nation which is not only astonishingly small, but it's getting smaller all the time. The Eucharistic community is shrinking in my culture and looks as if it might die. Sacramental Christian worship is on the wane. So I can't speak in the language and idiom of Gregory Dix or Kenneth Stevenson or Austin Farrer or Michael Ramsey or John Macquarie or Michael Welker or even Karen O'Donnell. Their confidence that the culture that shapes us will recognise the Eucharist's significance is one I cannot share. I've got to listen to Patricia Lockwood, who knows with part of her that it's a pointless and alien ritual which sounds like cannibalism and feels like watching paint dry. Yet at the same time, another part of her continues to ask, is this eternity breaking in? What has the invisible world to impart to time and space and bodies? In the course of this series, I will be asking questions of the ritual of Eucharist. Some of these questions are, if you like, historical ones, because there's actually an intimate relationship between our split modern sensibility about what is real and the bitter, bloody historical debates about how and what the Eucharist could mean. Others of those questions are literary, others anthropological. Still others try to look attentively at individual experience of Eucharist, and how it is mediated. The whole enterprise is, to use a fancy word, epistemological. I am framing a question about what we know of the reality of Eucharist in the light of our dissociated nature of our usual knowledge systems. I can't promise to get as far as an answer. I've chosen a geometrical metaphor as a way of navigating this, which is why the lectures are called four-dimensional Eucharist. This seems fitting for a rite which joins the physical world to the invisible truths of heaven by means of a remembered, broken body. In this series of four lectures, this morning's lecture is asking about the Eucharist's point. That is, it locates Eucharist on a map of meaning. Later, we look at two-dimensional textual and screen-based manifestations of the right, and at the anxious dominance of linear argument upon its gifts. Next week, space and bodies, and then time and memory, come into prominence in the two sessions with which this series will finish. Of course, these geometrical divisions are artificial. You can't talk about the point of Eucharist and leave out everything it's made of in terms of words and time and space and bodies and memory. You can't discuss online Eucharists or textual organisation without thinking about the physical actions of persons in a place. And you can't talk about the way the Eucharist enacts meaning as theatre does without looking backwards and forwards along a temporal line. Theatre, after all, is made of events happening in time. The metaphor of the four dimensions is only a way of examining the layers of something whose layers are never separated. But to look at them one by one will let us see the Eucharist's elements and the connections between them. So what is the point of the Eucharist? 
In geometrical terms, a point is a locator within a space, though paradoxically it takes up no space itself. Strictly speaking, it's not even one-dimensional until its location is joined to another diff different location to make a line. In the figurative sense of ordinary speech, a point is one of the many spatial metaphors we use to order our thoughts. The point of a discourse is signaled to be the heart of its meaning, a figurative place to locate the source of or the conclusion to an idea. If you say to someone else, no, you're missing the point, you mean that they've left out, ignored or looked away from the heart of the meaning as you see it. However, points tend to arise as part of a dispute as to what might be that defining heart of meaning. So, as well as the person making the point, another will be making a counterpoint that aims to redefine what is most important. The relation between point and counterpoint may be a dance or a battle, a joined or a broken line. And as well as its significance for formal verbal argument, there is, of course, a whole branch of musical structure based on this premise. Can we learn anything about the point of the Eucharist through this metaphor? I, I think we can. It comes, though, with difficulties because the dance between points that makes up the theological disputes on the Eucharist is deeply, irreconcilably fractured, part of a history of bitter internecine ideological conflict. Its lines are broken, and with it potentially the lines of communication between participants in the act of worship. What are the differing points of this broken line? For some, the point of the Eucharist will be unity. Full participation in the ritual knits together the body of Christ, a body corporate of people joined in community. For others, Eucharist divides. It divides the holy from the unregenerate or the unready. These are not necessarily judgments between believers and unbelievers. Many who confess and call themselves Christians will not be invited to eat at some iterations of the Holy Table, either because of differing theologies of communion, or because of institutional judgments about an individual's mode of life, or because the person is deemed not yet to understand enough to receive the benefits of Eucharistic participation. And I've put on the screen um, the rubric for the 1549 Book of Common Prayer right at the beginning, where it says, for those who don't read black letter easily, so if any of those coming to communion be an open and notorious evil liver, so that the congregation by him is offended or have done any wrong to his neighbours by word or deed, the curate shall call him and advertise him not in any wise to presume to the Lord's table, until he have amended his former naughty life. Liturgically, within the rite of Eucharist itself, both division and unity are central elements. For distribution, there must be fraction. To be shared, the blessed bread must be broken. For the community to be unified, it must also be demarcated. Here is another broken line. For some, the point of the Eucharist will be the transformation brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit upon the material elements of bread and wine, the real presence of Christ in the elements. Such worshippers will treat those elements with special reverence, and the physicality of the acts of eating and drinking will therefore matter a great deal. For others, the point of Eucharist will be an internal recollection a memorial of an act once done long ago and now over, which Jesus enjoined his followers to remember. For those people, the elements of bread and wine are nothing much in themselves, and the eating and drinking is less the point than the remembering it engenders. In modern Anglicanism, and indeed in its liturgies from the 1540s onwards, a good deal of effort has been put into blurring the difference between real presence and memorial iteration, and today's faithful are implicitly but forcefully invited to look away from those differences, 
because the history of that difference is a bloody one. Another fracture of perception. For some, the act of Eucharist contains within it the suffering of Calvary. The holy meal prefigures the breaking of God's body on the cross. 17th century manuals of Eucharistic devotion would ponder the violence involved in the material production of bread and wine, the pulverized grain, the trodden grape, the action of tongue and teeth upon the elements. Then they'd walk a straight line imaginatively from that everyday necessary violence of processing and consuming food to the saving gift of Christ's crucifixion, the lethal pressure upon his physical frame, the effusion of blood and water from his wounded side. For others, the eating metaphor works quite differently. The feast is a heavenly one, a foretaste of a banquet in which nothing and no one will ever suffer any more, and every tear is dried. Rather than contemplating time and gravity breaking eternity in the dying body of Jesus, the eschatological worshipper instead contemplates eternity as it mends the ravages of time and gravity. The earliest worshippers tended to this eschatological view. Later liturgies from the 4th century onwards looked rather to the cross. The point of the Eucharist then is embattled, a dance of contrasting points. This rite of communion contains the irre irreconcilable. I come not to bring peace but a sword, said Jesus in one of his wryer, grimmer moments, and in this prophecy he was entirely correct. The history of Eucharistic theory, taking it just since the Reformation, is a history of fraction. Not just of violent ideological divisions, though it's certainly that, but of the fracturing of the modern sensibility itself. The point has been made by a good many people in a good many different intellectual disciplines, but here is a version of it articulated in 1978 in the words of J. P. Singh Uberoi, sociologist and philosophical anthropologist, in his influential book Science and Culture, a critique of hegemonic Western systems of thought. He says this, the Protestant reformer Zwingli insisted that in the utterance, this is my body, hoc est corpus meum, the existential word is, est, was to be understood not in a real, literal and corporeal sense, but only in a symbolical, historical or social sense. By stating the issue and forcing it in terms of dualism or more properly double monism, Zwingli had discovered or invented the modern concept of time in which every event was either spiritual and mental or corporeal and material, but no event was or could be both at once. Spirit, word and sign had finally parted company for man at Marburg in 1529. Uberoi went on to argue that the Zwinglian categories became the basis for modern Western scientific thought, a system in which there was no necessary connection between symbol and reality, and one therefore in which all ritual became potentially empty of meaning. Sound familiar? Is that a world you recognize? It may not be true, but it is frequently assumed to be true that ritual does nothing and that words are not acts. These are shaping cultural assumptions for us, so they're also challenged regularly. And within this world of ours, therefore, there is a question which will occur to most people sooner rather than later. And that question is, why worship at all? In a knowledge system where the symbolic is divorced from efficacy, where God doesn't need worship either to do or to be, and where nothing and no one is changed by doing it, what's the point? What is the point of the Eucharist? Why spend time and energy on this ritual, its meanings as broken by violence as the body it remembers, its hopes of unity as impossible as the resurrection to which it lifts its eyes? Why bother? 
I said a minute ago that the Eucharist contains the irreconcilable, and you can hear that in two ways. It might just mean that the Eucharist is made up of contradictions. Or you could shift that meaning centre of gravity subtly and say instead that Eucharist holds those contradictions in bounded relationship through its ritual shaping. The historian of religion, Jonathan Zittel Smith, argues that ritual gains force when incongruency is perceived and thought about. What happens then when the brokenness of Eucharist, the broken body embedded within it, but also the fissures of its violent history, is enclosed by the actions of its ritual? For ritual is not only a bridge between physicality and the unseen world, it also sits on the border between the dead weight of what is and the quick energy of what might be. Both what is and what might be have to find full expression within the ritual enactments of the Eucharist. Heartbreak and hope are both its honoured guests, for without the one, the other cannot be complete. The participant in Eucharist is both a realist and an idealist, able to look steadily at the worst humanity can do, and yet still to affirm the primacy of love. Sacred force lies in incongruence. The ritual mode has been called by the Jewish scholar Adam Seligman a subjunctive mode, that is, a mode in the grammar of possibility which lifts our eyes to a transformation whose way is hope. This is not fantasy, but a powerful invocation, a bridge between seen and unseen, giving us the life which inscribes our meaning upon our bodies, both singly and collectively. Living in the subjunctive mode makes us more than the bald components of ourselves. It can happen in small ways. When we thank someone for passing the salt, we posit a world where gratitude is the basis for all transaction, even though we know this is not the world in which we currently live. Or it can happen in universe-changing ways. All the physical stuff of life might be changed utterly, were bred to become God, so that God might nourish us into life by his death. In Eucharist, that vision is realised, declared within the bounds of the ritual, to be present and active, as it cannot be in the mess and violence of the world. Yet, the mess and violence of the world, what that mess and violence did to God, and continues to do to people, is what makes up the ritual of Eucharist, so that real and ideal meet within it, and kiss each other. Sacred vision is full of these subjunctives. The Lord be with you operates in a kind of subjunctive mode, wishing an action of blessing which only God can make, in the trustful hope that God will act upon it. Blessings themselves invoke God, but they cannot command God. The subjunctive mode is also the mode of prayer and of supplication. Without it, stuck in the prison of is and was, without the promise of liberation into what might be, we are poor indeed. So this is the point of the Eucharist. In its ritual enactment, we bring into view a world beyond the finite, finite outcomes of the one we know. In it, a story of loss is remembered as restoration. A story of dying becomes a kind of rebirth. In it, violence becomes nourishment and a tragic sorrow, inexhaustible joy. A world where we celebrate the Eucharist is one in which bread indeed changes the universe because the maker of the universe declares that it may. Would you not long to be part of such a world.